I work 12 hours a day minimally because I love what I do. I don't recommend that for everybody if they don't love what they're doing because you'll burn out. But for me, it's easy. For me, working is like golfing or, or traveling. It's my joy. And I, back to another joke I made, the one hour is a seven minute meeting. 40% of my meetings in a 12 hour day are 15 minute meetings. Think about that. And that's people and it's execution. and it's. I'm trying to build a fucking empire. I have to buy the Jets and win a Super Bowl before I die. Hey, look, I, how, are, how are you gonna buy the suit? How, how are you buying the Jets? You, I'm, buy, you, I'm gonna buy the Jets because VaynerX, the holding company, and VFriends are both billion dollar companies. I'm gonna make them as big of billion dollar companies as possible. The owners of the Jets are gonna pass away at some point because they're significantly older than me. They're gonna go up for sale and I'm gonna take all my money and fucking buy it. The number five. The number five. The Jets. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I know you probably saw that piece of content, so you're trying to set me up. I got choked up in a talk recently. I, uh, for the people that follow me, I always throw up the five in my photos. People are always asking why. The Jets thing. I was, uh, this is fun because it's been referenced. I was born in the Soviet Union. We were really poor. It was really hard. It was really hard. And my family was really tight, right? Immigrant shit. And we moved to a new town in New Jersey, Edison, New Jersey. And it was the 80s. It was 1980. It was August 1982. I can tell you exactly when it was. And I, you know, I was seven. And my mom's like, go outside. This is what we did. For all the youngsters under 25, 30 in here, we used to go outside. It was crazy. <laughs> so, you know, and my mom was not even. It wasn't even 80s, she was from the old country. We're like six year olds. This is real in Russia. In Russia, everyone was scared of the government so nobody kidnapped anything about anything. So seven year olds used to walk 30 minutes to their grandma's house. So my mom was just like, go. So I was just always outside and I ran across these kids. They were throwing a Nerf football. They're like, what's your favorite football team? I'm like, you know, I was just getting settled into the culture. I was like, I don't know. They're like, well, we're, we're a Jets fan. And that was the 82 season, and the Jets went to the AFC Championship game that year. And so I was like, oh, this is good. And, uh, and literally since 1982, I have not missed a play of a New York Jets game in real time, watching or going, ever. I've not missed a single play since 1982. So it's my great escapism. When I look at people who are very deeply religious, I really understand it, because no question, the Jets are my religion. That Sunday is my church, I don't miss it. I'm like an 80 year old lady in Alabama for Sunday church, you know, like I'm in. And they all had Jets jerseys and I wanted one. I was seven, I was like, mom, I want one. We weren't spending 30, 20, $15 on a Jets t-shirt back then. That's how much we spent on food for the week. And so unbeknownst to me, my mom stayed up late at night after she put us to bed, me and my sister, and she knitted me a Jets jersey and put the number five on it. And it is my prized possession. You know, I have it very secured. It's why the number five means a lot to me. That was my favorite number then, she put it on. That's why I do this. Because I want my mom to know that she's the most important person in the world to me and that every accolade, every success, everything good that will happen to me is a direct correlation to how she parented me. And, thank you. And I've got it super tucked away in a fireproof glass case because in 25 years when I buy the Jets, I'm gonna take it out of there. I'm gonna put it in the front of the stadium as soon as you walk in and I'm gonna tell the story of my family's journey and I'm gonna make people realize that you can go from not being able to even afford a jersey of your team to owning the whole fucking team. I'm aware that I've been disproportionately passionate over the last decade around hustle and hard work, right? Like, you know, when I wrote uh, Crush It, there was so much of that in 2009. I thought there was an amazing opportunity of the internet, YouTube, social media. That was true. People benefit from yeah. it, both of you, many who are watching. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think it's sad when you get to a place in your career where you can drive traffic for others by just the sheer mention of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not fun to be the subject of articles or keynotes where people are taking things 
and not yeah, painting like bandwagoning. It. Bandwagoning, it's just, yes, yeah, it's just not the full picture. And, uh, it's very clear if you read or watch anything for mm -hmm. even more than five minutes that I want people to be happy and be self-aware. Yeah. Do I believe that work ethic is a foundational piece of success? Yes, I do. Do I want anybody ever to work so much that they get depressed? Of course not. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I never think that money is the driver. And so I think, I think whether it's lazy headline reading or not doing homework, yeah, it's, it's not been it's not been the most fun to get dragged yeah. into. No, like, I, yeah, I I was like, oh, I found reading that. I was like, no, and there's there's so many people who are proof of the words that you say, me included. Um, so so yeah, it's like oh man, it's, just, it's, listen, just there's a there's a byproduct of success. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. where people will you know, hustle porn is a term, leverage porn is a term. Mm -hmm. Leveragepreneur is when you're using other people to build yourself up at the cost of the other person. And you know, I think that though, you know, as you get bigger, people will leverage you. And I'm okay with that because the truth always wins in the end. Right. And you know, I know the body of work that I put out, my intent. Um, and if you wanna clip one thing or one definitive statement from one talk without the context of the whole thing, of course you can say anybody says anything. Mm -hmm. But the reality is is that, you know, I, uh, I believe work ethic is important if you want to achieve hyperbolic success. I don't want to tell people how to be happy. Yeah. So why are you telling me how I should be happy? Uh, and there's plenty of people that are super depressed that work 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just hyperbolized link baiting, leverage penuring, and I'm okay with that. But at the same token, it's important not to uh, not take other people's points of view into account. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm in a constant you know, focus of that as well. A lot of people ask, how much do you sleep? And my answer is six, seven, or eight hours. And it fucks with people, right? Because they think I'm sleeping like an hour. Um, <laughs> and my point there is sleep's important. Like I, I don't know like, who thinks they're gonna survive without sleep. Sleep's important. What's important for what I'm about is what you're doing when you're awake. I'm fascinated by people who like say, I hustle, I sleep four hours, but then watch three hours of YouTube videos a day, right? And so for me, as you know, and what you're referring to as somebody who interacts with me, is you know, Tyler's sending you emails like, can you do 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 p.m.? Like, I'm, every minute I have is programmed. It's like more like 11.15 to 12. 25. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I mean, the amount of five and seven and 10 and 13, like, I, I basically, Tyler, what, I, I see your face, what do you think? It's eight, the eight o'clock until 11 p.m. is pretty much programmed to the minute with zero slots for anything but the next meeting. But I'm working out, right? But like, for, like, work, eight to 11, with zero lunch, zero downtime. Like, if I go take a piss, I'm cutting into some meeting. <laughs> now, but here's the thing, here's the thing. That's matching my happiness and the ambition. That is not for 99.9% .9 of people. I, time management needs to be predicated on what makes you happy and what is coming out of your mouth. The biggest thing I'm worried about is people are talking big game but then their actions don't match it. So to me, it's happiness first and then eliminating hypocrisy. And that's how I think about it. So for me, it's that because I love this game. It's what I would want to do and my ambitions are great and I enjoy it. I want to spend 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. on a meeting to build what I'm building. It's, it's what I love to do. It's no different than being in the studio or painting or, you know, it's just what I love to do. I get very upset when people um, try to suppress people from hardworking without realizing that that's what makes that person happy. And, you know, whether it's me or Jason Fried and, and DHH, like I think we actually agree on most things. I think the thing we probably would I'm curious in a sit down is, you know, is it up to us to know when Dan or Johnny or Susan are on the verge of burnout and or do we know, like telling people like you should work 40 hours a week or 160 hours a week eliminates knowing what they're about. I don't know what to say. 
I, I think none of us get to sit on an ivory tower and tell people what to do. You know, do I believe that hard work is an essential part of the kind of success that people define? I do. Do I think working so many hours that it burns you out that you need to retire or quit or you're unhappy in perpetuity is bad? Of course I do. I think this is a self-awareness game and actually I think it's a much more interesting game of like do you know why you're working or what are you trying to achieve? I would go crazy sitting on a farm in middle America or doing 28 weeks of vacation. It's not what makes me happy but I unbelievably am happy for the people that makes it happy. I love the process of building something the way I want to build it. I would go crazy having all people working remotely the way 37 Signals does. They would go crazy managing a thousand people under a roof. I think it's about self-awareness.